Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the origins of the summer metal mouthpiece, both classical and the jazz. First, we're going to start at the origins of it, the original patent. We'll get right to it. So what we have here is the patent from Henry Selmer for mouthpiece and wind instruments, metal mouthpieces. Filed February 20th, 1929, as you can see. It says January 20th, 1931 on the top left. Now this is interesting. The ligature is really interesting. So the mouthpiece looks like the first generation mouthpiece that we take a look at pictures of. And you can see in this top figure here, you can see in the top figure here, of course we have on a mouthpiece, the shank right here, which is tw number 24. And of course the rest of the mouthpiece. But on top of it, you see the little round thing and the triangular thing. Pieces number 18, 12, 16, and 14. That is the ligature. I've never ever seen this ligature in the wild other than in the patent documentation. We'll take a look at figure two. We have a better idea what the ligature looks like. On the sides, the mouthpiece, these mouthpieces, you'll see there's a slot here. There's usually multiple indents on the early ones too, and it slides in the slot. And you'll see this replicated in later mouthpieces, but it's really quite small. Scroll down to figure three. Now we have a view of it. You can see how it kind of slides into one of those slots there and holds the reed down. Of course, looking at this, you would have to push the reed in from the back side going forward. I'm not sure it would fit going this way very well. I'm not Well, I guess it would. We have to unscrew it. In fact, here's a um, here's an early screw on ligature for the metal mouthpieces. It's different though because it wraps around the mouthpiece. No single screw method. And scroll down to Figure Four. We can see the ligature itself. I can guess it could be easily be bent. Of course, the figure of looking down the throat. Inventor Henry Selmer by James Atkins, attorney. And those are the diagrams. We move on to the U.S. Patent Office where this was patented or submitted. Application filed February 20, 1929. Now what is, it's, it's related to improvements in wind instruments and the mouthpieces or saxophones or the like, such as clarinets, as we'll see. This was found on saxophones and clarinets early on. Now, you can just read this yourself. There's really nothing interested, interesting in here. These numbers on the left-hand side are the line numbers. See, here we have a further object to improve the reed holder or ligature without marring the reed or the mouthpiece, hopefully. So figure one is bottom pane view of the improved mouthpiece as we show longitudinal vertical section, side elevation, perspective view of the body, etc. Go back to the top here. This is opposite face the mouthpiece, relative flat inclined lay surface. Ordinary reed rests on the lay surface, 11, as the numbers were, held in position by the ligature. This ligature includes having the body forely and downward curved legs. So the little spider looking things here, 17, 13th holes with the pins in them. Pins 16 pass through the aperture 17, the arms 13, and pivotally connect to the ligature. So the ligature kind of goes with the thickness or angle of the reed. You have to remember Henry Selmer this time. He originally got into the business by making reeds. This goes on, talks about how a turn bears upon the outer surface of the reed, really the portion graved by the tongue, and maybe really seen from the drawing. When the screw is turned, it causes the inner end to move toward the mouthpiece. And the spring 19, which is in this figure too, we can see the spring here, 19. It's underneath the screw right at the very bottom here. So you can see how that kind of works. And there's really nothing special in there. Last page, I was just talking about the patent, how they can make some changes and what it's for. Let 
and by Henry Selmer. So that's the patent. Let's take a look at some early catalogs now, okay? So here I believe is the a 1929 catalog, or at least a sheet from a catalog or a magazine, and has now greater volume for saxophone and clarinet. You'll see these mouthpieces as the original equipment on the Selmer metal silver-plated clarinets of the era, um, but it's only short-lived for a short time. Now, what you also see is just below it says silver finish, but underneath that says gold burnish five dollars extra. So these came in gold plate. It says the Selmer metal mouthpiece heavily silver plated or gold plated. Usually, you put gold plate on top of silver plate. Silver will adhere to brass, and gold will adhere to silver. And it's for clarinet saxophone, made especially for the exacting player preferring a metal mouthpiece. Now, these mouthpieces are hard to find nowadays. The silver plate, I've never seen a gold plated one. Many of the silver plated ones I see are very pitted. If not properly stored, silver can pit just like coins can and everything. And the bore of it, the bore of it, which is, you know, the part that goes on the neck for the mouthpiece, is a little bit small on these mouthpieces. It has three facings A, medium. B, medium open, and C is longer and more open than B. You'll see more, I guess, Bs, I guess, out there. I actually haven't seen a C. I've seen As. These saxophone mouthpieces have patented tone chamber, giving the extra large volume of tone. Soprano is $11, alto 12, tenor 14, baritone 15. And the clarinet facings of HS, HS star, and HS double star. And price was eleven dollars that time. And came from the came actually this was a catalog outside of Canada, so I'm not sure if this is Canadian dollars at that time. It doesn't really identify that. Now this is a 1930 catalog, and we'll see once again some repairs master metals. It says tone chamber design, so there's no break in the flow of air with saxophone neck is inserted into the mouthpiece. Small outside dimensions and hard rubber inlay teeth press make these mouthpieces very comfortable to play. Prices include special ligature and cap. I wish they would show the ligature and cap. Is it the one that was originally designed or not? We're not quite sure. If you notice, it has the old fabricated in France on the very top flat section. You know, where most, most mouthpieces are round. This up on top is actually flat with the stamp on it. And then the Henry Selmer wreath logo back here. And you can see silver plate and gold plate once again. Silver plate, about $3 more, it looks like. So B-flat clarinet, soprano, alto, tenor, and baritone sax. So that's a 1930s catalog. Now we're looking at a 1950s catalog. And we'll see more modern transition. We have the standard or classical model. And we have the new jazz model. We have the newest model in a series famous for decades, Samuel's Paris metal jazz mouthpiece. The board is specially made to produce a bright tone quality is ideal for dance band work. And the standard model has the fine tone, superb workmanship, etc. And it says it's the mouthpiece chosen by famed Marshall Mule for his concert and recording appearances. Both models are unusually durable in facings, made the utmost precision, of course, of metal at that time. As you can see, $25, $27.50, $27.50 for a tenor. Now, th this is a class one mouthpiece. It has, take a close look, a round chamber. The jazz is different. The jazz, if you look in here, you'll see a horseshoe. And that's because in here, this goes down and stays flat. All the way down there, and that and that gives a lift to the to the uh, roof of the mouthpiece here, the table part that goes into the throat and makes it a bit raised at the bottom, so it's not round. It's horseshoe shaped, as they call it, horseshoe shaped. Next, we have a nineteen sixties catalog, and on the left hand side here we'll see jazz tenor and silver plated metal tenor. Actually, I think those are altos. 
The difference being is the, the tenor is usually longer back here. See how short that one is? I think that one's a tenor in the picture. So here's an alto and a tenor. See a difference? Those are both the same size. I think they're both altos. In the middle here, we have a silver plated metal, metal alto complete with special ligature and cap, metal tenor complete with special ligature and cap. And they have tip openings from A all the way up to H. And now I had a whole bunch of these from C double star D E F G H I and a J a long time ago because I was curious about them and I, I couldn't play the J. I couldn't play anything really above a G. It was just too big for the way I play. And, but I really stuck to like D and E and usually the ones that I have left over, are, these are all D's and E's. And you can see here, Selma Solus Reads too. I have I have videos about reads, by the way, including these Selma Solus Reads. Now we're getting to a more modern catalog um, because Selma, I believe, discontinued these mouthpieces. I really don't know when, probably, I'm guessing, 10 years ago. But here's a 2008 accessory show book. We go to page, I think it was 24. We can see here, of course, they're still selling them. You'll notice how long that picture is of this. This is an alto one. That's definitely a tenor one. How long the shank is. This is really short for the alto. That one's really long for the tenor. Oh, by the way, the jazz mouthpieces on the facing. You'll see it says jazz. This one has a facing of the tip opening on the lay there, D. I have a more modern one to jazz, but facing is on the front. It's an E. Of course, the most astonishing thing here is the price. So 2008, the Alto mouthpiece is $650, and the Tenor is $720. Amazing. Here's the facings and the length of the facings. I forgot the other part. Here's a just a, putting the segments together. The Jazz was 650 for alto, 720 for tenor, and the classical series was 540 for soprano, 575 for alto, and 600 for tenor. So those are prices in 2008. As I mentioned, here's a clarinet one. This one seems to be fairly pitted, as we can see in the picture here. Here's the entire Henry Selmer clarinet itself. You can see silver plated metal. Has an adjustable um, barrel on it. A couple more quick pictures of it. Here's the top of this mouthpiece. Change from the original one. It's still flat on the top. has H. Salmer on it. Here's all the pieces. Here's a picture of the early saxophone one. This is from basics-sax.ca from um, Helen K., I believe it was. Uh, emailed him before this. Grabbed the pictures from his website. This one is, of course, heavily worn, and you see the silver has kind of tarnished it a lot. But this is one of the earlier ones. You can see here. Of course, it doesn't have that weird ligature that we saw originally. They're using actually a modern ligature. That, that is not an early ligature. And that is actually in a patent I saw uh, much later. Okay, one of these. But you can see on the top of the mouthpiece how it's flat. A little bit closer look at it. By the way, brevet means patent in French. Here's some other pictures I have of one. Once again, heavy wearing it. Here's some more pictures that we have. Looking down the throat, you see it. As large a throat as possible in that one. This one has the 
basing information on the table itself. I mean, this one has the early read protector that slides onto the, the basic cap. It's before they came out with, you know, full size caps. Pretty nifty. I always wanted one of those, but never got one. Works of art going back in history and time. And you can see how this ligature, why they designed the other ligature the way it did. Because it slides into the grooves and this one just kind of, it doesn't really fit very well because it's round. The top is flat. Got all those grooves in there with just little fins on it. So like a modern ligature fits on it and it works, but really wasn't designed for it. Now, one time I was sent one of these mouthpieces and someone couldn't figure out what it was. And it seemed like it was a sax mouthpiece that was put in a lathe and turned down. The shank was turned down to work on a clarinet. As you can see here, it's after I kind of put a cork on it. But you can see here that the shank of it is clearly cut down, laid down. There's no silver plate on it. The design that we saw earlier on it is gone. And it's just... Now a flat shank ready to accept the cork, but no beginning or end to it. So I had to put a long cork on it. By the way, to the left of it is a soprano sax D mouthpiece. After that is a um, alto E mouthpiece. So you can see the size right there. So I'm guessing this at one time was maybe a soprano sax mouthpiece that they cut down for a clarinet. Now, this is really interesting. I forgot where I got this from. I think I got it from PM Woodwinds, I believe. This is, of course, a Henry Selmer mouthpiece, but you see engraved on it, Stenter. You also see they painted the kind of lines in here with the dots in them. Um, I don't know. I'm guessing they did this after the fact, and maybe they re-silver plated it after the fact and painted the insides i never really was able to find out who stenter was this one of course was refaced a bit you can see in the front the silver plates gone down to the brass looks like they stamped some markings on it well that's some of the history and going through catalogs the summer metal both classical and jazz mouthpieces as i mentioned the classical mouthpiece you'll see the wreath around the shank of the mouthpiece. This is a tenor. And um, it doesn't have anything on the table of what it is versus the jazz mouthpiece, like this one here. It actually says jazz on it. You can see that right there. This is an early one with the D on the table, as I mentioned. And this more modern one that has the facing, which is E, on the body. Now, for some reason, all the old ones that I have, the jazz ones had this emblem on it. And I have an earlier classical one that doesn't have the more modern one. It has this um, more gothic style emblem. I, I'm not sure I showed a picture of it. If you go back to the old catalogs, you can see the emblem difference of the classical one. I have one of those somewhere and I couldn't find it. But um, I have an alto piece and I have no idea where it's at. But anyways, as I mentioned before, you look down the classical, standard round chamber. And you look down the jazz, and it's a U-shaped chamber. And hope that gives you a good history of the summer metal model pieces. Going back to the original patent date and early pictures of it and everything. Don't forget to give a thumbs up, like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you later.